Okay, Colossians 3, 17. So would I to read that for us? The Bible's open, so. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Am I about right? Okay, so now we're well aware of the, the, the situation, the social economic situation of the people at Colossae. Yeah? Geographically, it's been a trade centre, but the road has moved. So economically, the trade and the jobs have gone with the road, because the road was the trade route. And that brought all the money through. And socially, because of all that, families are now dislocated and divided geographically, because the jobs have gone and the young have gone to pursue them in the way that the young do. And that's happened in an age when social service was your family, but they're no longer there. So you've got a picture in your minds, and you've, you've had for a few weeks, of what's going on in this situation in Colossae. And what's more, we've been seeing that's not just a trading recession, where a few macroeconomic factors have caused a serious temporary dip. Here's a structural recession, a readjustment has to take place that reflects a permanently changed situation. They weren't going to be able to trade their way out of this one because the trade has structurally gone away. And you may feel that there are themes there that reverberate with our own situation, certainly the bear on the messages that are being conveyed by the candidates in the forthcoming US presidential election to determine which person or what sort of person ends up with their hands on the biggest global economy and the nuclear button that is funded by it. Back to Colossi. And the way Paul is trying to get them back out of, not recession, but the heresy that they turn to for a bit of comfortable escapism in their recession. How's he doing that? He's turned them back to Jesus. He's turned them back to the character of Jesus and the implications for the way they live out their Christian lives of who Jesus is. How does that impact on a person who's following Jesus? He's been doing this in the first two chapters the character of Jesus and the sort of people they should be if they have such a saviour as that. And now he's applying those broader themes and in doing so, Paul stresses to his hearers the importance for their own spiritual resilience's sake of these three things. Here's what's important for your own spiritual resilience. Let the peace of Christ, God's anointed saviour, rule in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And thirdly, do the deeds of Jesus. This is all for your spiritual resilience. This is all for your spiritual strength. This is all so that you'll be equipped to take the storms and the gales that are going to be bashing you through your economic, geographical, economic and social circumstances and through your having bought into this heresy which you've turned to for a bit of light relief because you're feeling pretty rough. Yeah? That makes sense? Do the deeds of Christ this week. That's the one we come to this morning. Next week, Paul is going to come right down to brass taps and spell out how we do this in the homes and families that, that were dividing under this enormous socio-economic pressure from this recession. But for this week, we're looking at embodying the deeds of Christ in principle before the detail gets applied then to the pressurised households and families at Colossae Next week, maybe the week after. We'll better keep our powder dry there. Okay, so what whatever you do. Whatever you do. Verse 17. A. Whatever you do. Very few exhortations in the New Testament, so very, very thoroughgoing is this one. This is everything. There are very, very few that are as, you know, broad and inclusive as this. It covers every area of human life, whatever you do. Every activity is included in this. Every activity is to be undertaken in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything. Let's be absolutely clear. To follow Christ involves absolutely everything. It involves absolutely everything you do and say. Every area of life. <coughs> I've been kind of... <coughs> excuse me. Something going wrong in my voice box. We'll see what happens with that. 
Oh, what you got involved in on, on uh, October the 31st? But, to be honest, I've read such shocking things from across the Atlantic recently about Halloween. Have you? I read something on the Resurgence website, and this blog was unbelievable. A guy called Winfield Bevins, I've never heard of, I don't know the man, but they're on this reformed Christian American blog site with some very big people on it. it was this blog, Five Tips for a Happy Halloween. So I thought, what's that? What's, what's going on here? And I thought, ah, oh, it's a device, you know, it's a, it's a clever stunt to draw you in, yeah? And then, so I'd look at it. First tip, don't be a freak. Now, he's not saying don't be a freak in don't dress up as a, a witch or a ghoul and run around and knock on people's doors demanding gifts and favours. He's, he's not saying don't be a freak like that. He's saying don't be a freak in objecting to what happens on Halloween. Don't make yourself a Christian freak. And I felt myself, having read what he'd said, with not one biblical verse cited or principle mentioned, at the end of it, I found myself thinking, no, do be a freak. If that's what's normal, stand out. Second thing, be missional. And then he explained what he meant by that. That sounds great, be missional. Yeah. Tell people about Jesus, yeah. He said, go out and celebrate Halloween with your unconverted friends and hope you get to talk to them about Jesus. Celebrate the pagan festival, and as you're doing so, hope to be able to talk to them about Jesus. And thirdly, he said, set boundaries. I'm not advocating a whole celebration of Halloween. He says, much of it is dark and can, can introduce your children to the occult. But go out and do it anyway. Talk to your children about Halloween. Tell them about it. Educate them about it. So they know all about it. And then he says, fifth point, don't judge others. Good Christians can and do disagree on this issue. Perhaps. Perhaps there are many issues on which good Christians do disagree. I'm assuming he is a good Christian brother. I can certainly say that he and I do disagree strongly on this issue. Incidentally, he quotes not one biblical justification for any of his five points from start to finish. It's all just pragmatic. But whatever you do, I know this, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that didn't arise once. Now, over against the popular sellouts, we can all be drawn into, and we all see somebody else's blind spot far more easily than we see our own blind spots. Do it like this. Whatever you do. And that whatever is, is, is literally all that you do. I mean, I'll give you the brief here. It just says, and all of which you do. All that you do, everything. No room for manoeuvre there. Blow on that one. And in case we had missed the point, Paul explains a bit further. All that you do in word or deed. Now here's an interesting one. All that you do in words. Interesting idea, you find all across the Bible, but seldom find all across Wales in the 21st century. I guess we're all taught at school that sticks and stones, Caleb? Yeah, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Yeah, yeah. Words will never harm me. Words are nothing, are they? Well, they can be. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't say that. Yes, I mean, it's a, good, it's a good approach, okay? It's a good approach to say, ignore people when they're just giving you words of abuse. That's a great one. That's biblical. Say they can't harm you? It's not quite right. And there's an extent to which we've got to be careful what we do say about this because we can devalue the, the weight of words. Words. Words do have weight. Words do things. Mere words do do things. And we can watch, we have to watch out, we don't start eroding our view of the weight of words early on in life. Because, you know, hopefully you, you get into a settled relationship and maybe you get married, you get in a closer relationship. It's all too easy to downgrade the value of the impact of our words. And our words do do things. They affect our relationships. They affect what happens in the world. And Paul's clear here about the significance and the importance of what I'm going to call the speech act. Because speech is doing something. Speech isn't just talking. 
Speech does things. <clears throat> now you get in the Old Testament prophets, you get this sort of idea a lot, don't you? I mean, I love, do you love the Old Testament? I love the Old Testament prophets. Give me something to get my teeth into. Um, you get, you know, Jeremiah lies on this side, lies on the other side, and speaks, and you know, all that sort of stuff. And he goes out and buys a field, and you know, then the potter's house watches the pot happening. There are these acts, and speech and acts are tied up together. So it's not quite that we're looking at here. Here it works the other way around. Not deeds embodying speech, but speech actually being a, an act that does something. Words do something, Paul said. Whatever you do, in word or deed. It's something you do, whether it's a word or a deed. It's an action. And it carries weight. God's word changes things, whether it's creation's let there be whatever, or the Saviour's peace be still. Now in a secularist cap in a secularist campus. In a pagan person, a, a, a non-Christian atheistic person's point of view, words just words. It, it, it vibrates, it goes away. Perhaps. But biblically, words do things. Words work. So you do things when you speak. Speech matters biblically. Whatever you do, whether in word, which is a class of doing, or in deed. We are, we are reformed evangelicals and uh, we know the importance of faith, yeah? It's faith not works. Is that correct? I've been a mischief, it's okay, smile. <laughs> no worries. Well, that's true at one level, isn't it? Works comes by faith. No, works comes. Faith comes through hearing, hearing through the Word of God. Yeah, and, okay, let's talk about Ephesians 2. Um, <laughs> <coughs> by grace you say through faith. That, not in yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast, because we are God's workmanship. There's the work. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. There's the point and the purpose that he's prepared beforehand for us to walk in. Not only is there the, the plan and the purpose, there's the, the preparation, there's the eternal plan and purpose of God in here somewhere, for what he's doing with us. Quote the Romans, words are great in worship, but deeds amount to appropriate worship. All this stuff about being justified by grace through faith alone through chapters 1 through 11, right? And then chapter 12, living sacrifices, your appropriate act of worship. The trouble in this Colossians verse, of course, lies with the whatever. All you to be able to do anything with, and all that you set about doing it with whatever, the whatever of you, the all of you, in deed or in word. Jesus is pretty clear about the absolute nature of his claims on us. And crucially, in uh, Luke 10, 25, he, he sort of works on that idea. Um, <clears throat> the uh, religious teacher approaches Jesus in Luke 10, 25, and he says, Good teacher, you know, what must we do to do the works that God requires? What must I do to inherit eternal life? What's the big issue? And Jesus says, Teacher, tell me. It's great the way, it's a good important lesson to learn this actually, isn't it? The way that Jesus is approached the question and he says, Well, what do you think? And he drags the truth out of people out of their own mouths. Uh, I've known one or two people in my life who are good at doing that uh, in, in a Christian context, and uh, it's such a gift to be able to do it. And Jesus just does it with this guy. He says, What's in the law? How do you read it? You're a teacher of the law. What does the law say? And the teacher of the law goes to Deuteronomy 6 5 to the big declaration, you know, here, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Uh -huh. And then he goes to Luke 19, uh, Leviticus 19 18, and he says, Love your neighbor as yourself. So you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. And then he goes to Leviticus 19 from Deuteronomy and he plugs that in, Love your neighbor as yourself. Two things there. How to live the saved life, says Jesus. Jesus approves of what he says. Love the Lord your God with all you've got. Which of the Lord got that from Deuteronomy 6. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. He got that from Leviticus 19, 18. And Jesus says, absolutely. You go and do that, and you will live. And there's, there's the law work. Because here's a guy who's devoting all his time and energy to trying to do that perfectly, as if doing that perfectly is going to please God, which it would, but he can't, which is where he needs Jesus. Making sense? You've got the situation in your heads. While you've got your earthly life, 
While you've got the ability to do that, in word and deed, oh there you go, love the Lord your God, says Jesus. Now, okay, we've got an earthly life, that's great, it's fun. What have you got in that earthly life? You've got time and energy, haven't you? What have you got in this world? You've got time. And in that time you gather and expend both energy and money. Gather energy and you expend energy. You gather money and you expend money with the time that you've got. Where, where does yours go? What's it going to achieve? How do you spend your time and energy? It, it reveals not only what you are and who you are, it makes what you are, it makes who you are. That word for deeds here is, is, is ergon. Um, we're going to envisage a situation in a minute. Cal, have you got your hand up as if you want to ask a question? Yeah, what's the energy thing about? Oh, well, I'm just going to give you, I'm just going to give you an illustration, which might help, but if it doesn't, you come back at me, okay? What's an engine? Well, it's an engine. Well, it's an engine. Yes, we're going to agree on that. What's an engine, Callum? What does it do? Well, it's like a motor. Like a motor? Yeah. So it's basically like a hydraulic a heart. Mm -hmm. Basically, like legs. We've been through all sorts of interesting um, thoughts and arms. ideas. What do you put in the engine? You put oil, diesel, petrol. Brent, is it a two-stroke? Is are. it petrol? It's never going to get technical. Is it a two-stroke? <laughs> you put fuel in, yeah? Yeah. So you put the means of raw energy in. An engine is a device for turning energy into work. No, it's not energy, it's fuel. It's not energy. Yeah, when you go When you go to a petrol station, it doesn't say petrol, diesel, energy. Like Mike said, <laughs> trying to get into this. <laughs> the fuel has got the potential of energy when you set fire to it then it creates energy. Or compress it. So what you've got there going into that engine is an amount of energy and technically trust me. An engine is a device for turning energy into work. Quite often rotary motion but certainly into work. Okay, just live with that a minute. Because we're going somewhere with that. Live with that idea. If an engine is a machine for turning energy into work, that's quite close to what a Christian does. That's quite close to what Paul is asking for here. The Christian has been reunited to Almighty God by the sacrifice and intercession of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the energy of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And what your bodily life is there to do as a Christian is to turn the energy of God, which is a pretty potent source, into work. Whatever you do, says Paul, in word and deed. To all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Your deeds burn up two precious things you've got in this finite terminal life, your time and your energy. And what you get from expending them in this present evil age, deeds for God. Deeds for God. Mm. Time and energy are invested in this world to produce money, and money's a big issue in the Testament church. Use that, says Paul. Here are your deeds. Uh, I, I, every time I use the M word, I feel kind of a little frisson of fear and nervousness and want to walk away. But Paul consistently talks about money. Have you noticed the extent to which he talks about money? He's one of those preachers that's always talking about money. Maybe he didn't get paid or something. He's a, well, there's some of that about and there's some of the other thing. Because what he says is, you know, I wish that you, your love would be renewed for me kind of thing. Yeah. It's a bit short this month, boys. Or he says... I'm adequately supplied. Yeah. But whichever one he's saying, he's just straight up front about it. Yeah. Yeah. Big issue in the New Testament church, collection for the Jerusalem saints. That, that was the first noteworthy expression of faith of the new Gentile churches that the church in Jerusalem had to sit up and take notice of. And Paul spent a lot of time on that collection for the saints in Jerusalem because they were going to be short. It gives a lot of time and energy and page space to it. Virtually every, every New Testament epistle, certainly in the years of captivity, makes mention of the financial needs of the team. And Paul's very direct and very plain about the state of his own finances, his funding situation, needs or sufficiency, equally frank with both, because the funding of Jesus' mission is the responsibility of the faithful ones, his followers, and their deeds. Their deeds are to make it happen. 
as well as to relieve the saints who are in trouble. You know, I'm very good at this. I'm very good at reading the New Testament, not seeing a lot of things. <laughs> yeah? It's very easy to do that, isn't it? I'll see. Paul is always one of those preachers who's always talking about money. And it's either good news or it's bad news, but he's talking about it anyway. That too is the deed that constitute the sort of worship in action referred to as the fruit of that gospel that Paul has set out in the early chapters of Romans, all 11 of them, and talks about then as their, their, their living sacrifice in 12 one follow. Your deeds. Love the Lord your God. That's the first tablet of the law, isn't it, that Moses came down the mountain with. That first set of commandments is love the Lord your God with all your heart. So, Paul is saying, don't slack off now God sent his son for your salvation. Firstly, whatever you do, in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus wants your deeds to express your love for the Lord. But then the second part of that answer, as he's dealing with the, the, the religious teacher, Jesus goes on to the second part. And love your neighbour as yourself. He goes on to the second table of the law. And he quotes Leviticus 19.18 as that teacher of the law. And Jesus says, yep, well said. Love the Lord your God. Do the deeds that are worship to him and love your neighbour as yourself. How far have we got there? What on earth are we looking at here? Well, that's the issue the teacher of the law wants to perceive. He's not going to argue with Jesus about loving the Lord your God. Yes, that's fine. He's going to want to argue about the neighbour bit. The teacher of the law, it says, seeking to justify himself, wants to get on and pursue this one with the Lord Jesus. And instead of getting drawn into a big argument, Jesus decides to tell him a story. We can learn from that. Couldn't we? When we're chatting with people and a discussion ensues, we could, we could learn from not actually pursuing, necessarily, the combat of argument. We could go, well, who do you think of this? And tell him a story. And Jesus tells him the story of, do you know? Who is my neighbour? The good Samaritan. Yes. The good Samaritan. Jesus then tells the story of the good Samaritan about who is my neighbour. Now let's be sure we understand who is meant by our neighbour. Because much as we might admire and aspire to the heroic act of rescuing in a personally dangerous situation, somebody who's socially unacceptable, a stranger we find bloodied and battered in the street, mm -hmm. we need to be sure of first base. Good neighbouring is pretty significant in scripture in terms of the mission of the church. There's only one good Samaritan who does an extreme thing like that. There's only one Ananias who takes his life in his hands and goes to Straight Street in Damascus and finds Paul. But good neighbouring is pretty significant in Scripture in terms of the true mission of the church, bringing people to Jesus. Andrew found his brother Simon Peter, brought him to Jesus. Oh, what a world would that kick off? A Samaritan woman finds the people in her town, goes back into the town, finds them and says, Come and see a guy who told me everything I ever did. Bit of a statement, we hope. But there's that good neighbouring stuff going on. It's important in the mission. But what is important in the church's mission, it's at least equally important in the church's simple obedience to Jesus. We're not talking about doing this for mission. We're talking about doing this because this is what God requires of us. We could neighbour, not with the ulterior motive of, of just bringing people to Jesus, not with the ulterior motive, maybe with the ultimate motive. We'd love that to happen. Paul says to Felix, you know, Felix says, Paul, do you want to persuade me to be a Christian? You're on trial before me today. Says, but, yeah, same as me, but for these chains. I'd love that to happen. That's our ultimate motive. We'd love to see that happen if the possibility ever rolls onto the agenda. But we're good neighbour in any way because that's what Jesus wants us to do. Whatever you do, in word and deed, love the Lord your God. Love your neighbour as yourself. Okay, good neighbour in first place. Just ask yourself the question the religious leader put to Jesus on that day. Who is my neighbour? I've been around all these museums recently. And uh, <clears throat> used to be in a museum. You walk into, you wouldn't know this because you're young. But you used to walk into a museum and there'd be stuff to look at. Museums used to be like that. 
Okay? You were walking along and looking at the wall, and there was a little plaque, if you like, it told you what you were looking at. And there were sometimes guides who tut tutted if you talked, and they were there to improve the quality of your life and your understanding. You know, not a great help. So, yesterday we were in a museum, and you were holding weapons and firing guns, right? Well, that's a proper museum, isn't it? You're doing stuff. It's called the interactive learning experience. And not to be outdone, this is Grace Church. I fired a gun. So, so, it's not learning. so today, right, this is the interactive learning experience. It involves a sheet of eight ball and a pyro. Okay, there you go. One of those. That's lovely, marvellous. I'm getting very bored and cold with that. I've got two there, I'll just do one. Pass it about. That's it, lovely. You can work together, children, that's fine. Um, I'll let you go. <laughs> See that house in the middle there? Sorry, I can't understand it. Oh, you're a bit bad. That's a good teacher. I'll give Mike a red pen because he likes colours. Do you have any more pens in? I went to look for a box of pens. And where there used to be a box of pens, I found my children had been. I've got a pen. Do you have a pen? Do you have a pen for shirt? I knew a student. I have a pen. I don't know, are you good enough? Okay. Okay. So here's how it goes. See in that middle house there? That's where you live. But it doesn't look like my house really. <clears throat> That's where you live. So don't write anything in there. Just just put, put your address if you want to or the name of your house or whatever. Next to it, just put the name. Uh, just just in that, in that, in that section, just put your address. Okay, then you'll see A on, on your sheet of paper. I haven't done this yet. So this goes on. Just take a minute. On, on A, write against A in each of those boxes the name, if it's first name or surname, of the eight people who live nearest to you. Now, of course, where, where you live, right, people are all stacked up. Yeah? <laughs> people are all stacked up. You've only just moved in there, so this is a bit unfair on you. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we have our nearest neighbours are like, in some cases, like, need a mile that way, <laughs> or whatever, and they won't be on a grid pattern, yeah. yeah? So what we do is we're going to write down the name of our nearest neighbours, and then... Uh, per house, or one person per book? No, per house we're talking about. Per house? Yeah. So there's two people... Households. There's two people in the house, do they go, are they A and B, or both in it? No, they go in A, please. So yeah. they're in each, each Oh. Yeah, and there's, there's, there are eight boxes around the outside of your house. And against A, we haven't done this before, it's not going well. <laughs> around the outside there, for A, you put the name, or the names, if there are two people, or as many names as you can of the people who live in that dwelling. Okay, so there we go. Uh, I'm still not sure, is it one per box? One house. One house. Oh, that's one. Yeah. One house. Yeah. Remember her name there? Oh, three letters. Can't pick Benny. Can't remember their names. Five letters. I can't remember that. I know them, but I don't know their names. Eight adjacent or the eight most adjacent you can remember their names. The nearest to you, and whether you can remember their names or not. The Swansea. If it's not, you put a question mark. Dad. They're near to you, but you don't know them, their name. You put a question mark. Right. Dad. I can the, see their faces, but I can't think of the name. Yeah. Dad, does Swansea count? <laughs> no. no. It's the nearest to where you live at home. Oh, okay, I get it. Okay, so we're going on. Well, we're getting ahead of that. Okay, got the impression. So on the next one, it says B. Okay. So where it says B, write down. Just some piece of relevant information about that person, some data or fact about him or her or them that you couldn't see by just standing in your garden or on your drive. Well, you have to have an account of them. <clears throat> you, that's it. This is people exactly, that's the word in my head, person you've had an encounter with, so you know something about them. You're looking for stuff you've discovered by odd encounters or conversations. They grew up in the valleys. He is a teacher. She plays golf. He had a father in World War Two, you know?
Okay, how's it going? Really, really badly. <laughs> That's great, no, don't worry about that. It's not a, it's not a, you know, it's just a sort of thinking about this whole idea as an idea we've got to think about here. So in those boxes under C, and you might want to complete this later at home, just try and write down some in-depth information of the sort you know after having had a sensible chat with somebody. You've got to know them quite well, their career plans now, or their plans or dreams to start a family or a small business or a veg patch. You, you've learned something about the purpose of their lives, or you've learned something about the challenges they face or what motivates them to do what they do or what they most fear, or maybe just maybe what do they say about their spiritual beliefs or practices, if they say anything about them at all, probably they don't. So, okay, we're going to stop and so you want to complete it, possibly. How on earth did you get on? People who study things, things like this say that for suburban America, about 10% of people only mm -hmm. can fill out the name of their eight nearest neighbours. If you're going to love them, you'd normally want to know their name. At least as much as that. They reckon about 3% of people only can fill out line B for each home. 3% can fill out line B. Less than 1% can fill out line C for their neighbours. 
I'm sad. <laughs> yeah, I know, but that's suburban America. That's suburban America. We're a bit of an advantage because this is rural Wales. It's also related to the amount of traffic on the street. Dad? It's related to the amount of traffic on the street. So there's a lot of traffic down your street, you're less likely to know your neighbours. That's a very interesting fact to add in the mix, isn't it? Dad, I couldn't do line to see. So you made, so you made an aeroplane out of your piece of paper. Very good. That's a very good use for it. Let's take one step back and just try and consider what Jesus does mean here. Okay? He's saying, love your neighbour as yourself. He says to love your neighbours. This is how you express the gospel. This is how you follow Jesus, he says. He said to love our neighbours. Now, of course, that means our metaphorical neighbours, people everywhere in need, okay? But it includes metaphorical neighbours, but not metaphorically loving them. They might be metaphorical neighbours because they're away away, but it doesn't mean you don't love, in a literal sense. Of course, it extends to the stranger in trouble in the street, the people we work with, the parent on the kids' rugby team, the person on the other side of the world who's in need of a meal. But it also means our actual neighbours, the ones it's harder to put off loving because they're not at a distance from us. And yes, this is Wales, and yes, some of us have got challenging neighbours. So, of course, loving some of our neighbours is going to be a bit like loving the unlovely, and we're back to the parable of Good Samaritan again. But that's postgraduate level stuff. We've just been looking at the simple stuff. Kindergarten, my three. Do what he says in my name. What are you doing? Well, indeed. He's explained elsewhere what he means by that. Do it in my name. Who on earth does something in somebody else's name? Quickly, Caleb, and then I'm going to bump to quickly. A fraud person. A fraud person? Ah, yeah. I don't think Jesus is talking about fraud and <laughs> filling a cheque in somebody else's name. Um, I hadn't thought of that. No, before. that's a good one. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that at all. Who, who, well, we are. It's supposed to show, doesn't it? You can see both ears. You got your dad there. A representative sort of person. So, a so spy! <laughs> no. <laughs> Not a spy, no. You'd normally, Caleb, normally, in normal terms, you'd say perhaps a professional sort of person, wouldn't you? A solicitor to something in somebody's name, an advocate, or being a, 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 an executor of a will, maybe a teacher educating our children in our name, because the responsibility is ours, they're just in loco parentis, in the place of the parent. Maybe an employee trying to carry out the instructions of an employer in the name of the company or something. But in the ancient world, in Paul's words, who was it who acted not in their name but another's name? Jesus. A servant or a slave. Yeah. Okay. A servant or a slave was a tool in the hand of their master. Aristotle talks about this, the slave being a tool in the master's hand. Doing what he's doing in somebody else's name. A husband representing a wife who in those days had no rights, but everything was done legally by a husband for her. A steward running a responsible job on behalf of his master, running the whole household, but not getting the wage. Now those are the pictures that describe followers of Christ in the Bible. And they put flesh on the idea of doing your deeds in his name. The Bible's full of followers, not fans, making much of the lordship of Jesus. What is he? He's Lord. To come to Christ in Scripture is to repent of self-rule and come into the kingdom of God. That's what it is. You come as his subject in his kingdom and you honour him as Lord and you bring him tribute in the form of doing his deeds after him. That's the picture. Lord language. But then you, you go a bit further into that and it gets even more overt than that, completely in keeping with the context of those days. None of us objects too much to the word servant in Scripture, do we? We're servants of the Lord, yes. What a right to be a servant in our times. That's because being a great person's servant is still not too obvious to us. But the problem with that is that the Bible is translating, what is it, using that word servant, to translate another word altogether, the word slave in the Greek New Testament. And that's all through Scripture, describing the followers of Jesus as his slave servant. Now, of course, if a person served a master as his slave, 
There's an Old Testament context for this, and the, the master treated him well, and he loved his master, but the time of his uh, bondsmanship, or whatever it was, was coming to an end. He could say, look, you know, make, make me your life slave, and they'd go, they'd find, you look, you like this bit, um, they'd find the doorpost, you know, and they'd find the bradle in the toolbox, and they'd go up to the door, and they voluntarily, they'd stick the bradle through this guy's earlobe, to the doorpost. And this was a sign now that he's become that guy's servant for life. Ow. Because it was a good situation for him. The master treated him well, he loves his master, and that person is then going to be the master's willing slave, working, being provided for in the master's household for the rest of his mortal days. And that's what we're dealing with. Such people do the deeds of Christ, following him gladly, doing his deeds in his name. In his name, you see. Who does your deeds in your name? Your slave, your servant. And particularly certain sorts of servants who are known as stewards. Remember the parable of the good steward in Matthew 25. We don't need to spend too much time with that. And where do we find the theological justification for all this thinking, this in his name language? Where do we find it? 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, you are not your own, Paul says to those believers in Corinth, you are not your own. We tend to think of ourselves as being our own man, our own woman, our own person. Paul is saying, biblically, you are not your own, you were born at a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. Do your deeds as God's servant in his name. Here's the theological justification. You were born with a price. You are his servant, you are his slave. And then 1 Corinthians 7 uses the same sort of idea again. You were bought at a price, do not become slaves of men. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now we're going to come to that perhaps another time. So in conclusion, it's a really heavy emphasis here on Christ's deeds, and we tend to try and miss that in Scripture. Whatever you do, whatever you do in word and deed, now this is for your, this is for your spiritual resilience, right? This is so that you can be strong in the Lord. This is so that at times of real difficulty and hardship that you're going through, geographically there have been changes, economically the situation has been difficult, that's had social implications for you, and your future is tied up on, in that on this earth because your social services is your family, and they've gone away because of the changed circumstances. Bear in mind that to be Resilient in that context, here's what you need to do. Do, do Christ's deeds. In word and deed, do everything. In the name of God the Father. Through, uh, in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, of course, it gets set in the context, and of course, it's written to believers, but bear in mind it is written to build up their spiritual resilience. Exercise certainly tones up the muscles, doesn't it? Following Christ firms up the heart. Whatever you do in word and deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. This will firm up your heart to do the deeds that he requires of his people. And following him is a whole life encounter. An encounter springing from whole human following of Jesus. His peace, his word, and his word. Oh, I feel spiritually weak, I feel all battered and all that. Go and do the deeds of Jesus, says Paul. Mm -hmm. And grow in your spiritual resilience as you do everything through.